I was hired by the town of Walden in the fall of 1978. I was a four-year honors degree grad from Laurentian University in the Canadian History Department. This project was just getting off the ground. The town of Walden bought the Anderson Farm property in the winter of 77-78 and then they applied for granting and funding and they had a, a group of students on the Anderson Farm site that summer of 78 and then they got a 10-month contract to continue restoration and renovation in the farmhouse and uh, the rest of the grounds and I was hired through that grant and I've been here ever since. One of the suggestions coming out of there that the town of Walden acquire the Anderson Farm property for heritage and recreational purposes. At the time, the Anderson family, the older, the founding generation were gone and the children were still around and the estate was open. One of the local subdivision developers had a bid in on the property, 14 acres. The town took the suggestion and worked with the family and the family actually accepted a lower bid from the town of Walden for the property on the condition that the name Anderson remain attached to the site. And the town of Walden agreed to this even though they had an application for funding out there one of the first Winterio grants, uh, that grant hadn't been approved when the town made the offer and agreed to buy it. It was only a month or so later that they found out they had received the grant. So this firm originally was purchased from a person who had gotten it from the, uh, from the Crown, because it was Crown land, Oscar Kumala. The Anderson, Frank Anderson, bought it from Kumala in 1910. If you look at the census for Coppercliffe in 1900, you'll see a boarding house run by Herman Lottie. And listed there is his wife, Mary. Mary's sister, Greta, who is listed as a spinster, she's 18. A single gentleman, Frank Anderson. Oscar Kulmala is also living in the same boarding house. 1901, Frank and Greta got married. As the site and the focus of the project evolved. We have the looms here and we do demonstrate weaving on the loom and eventually the looms will wear out simply from wear and tear. They're made of wooden frames and wood is going to wear down. You can see the wear marks on the looms that we have here simply because they become sacrificial items. By demonstrating the weaving, we preserve that part of the community's history, perpetuate the skills that are needed to be able to set up the loom, to uh, teach people how to recycle. Everybody in this society thinks they invented recycling. Well, our early settlers were recyclers of necessity. One of the things I do with school children is try to make what they're looking at relevant to their own lives. With younger kids, it's more difficult, but you can pick and choose the topics because we have a good collection to work with. One of my favorite is we have the Anderson's wedding picture taken in Coppercliffe in 1901. And I'll ask a school group, how many of you have ever been to a wedding or seen pictures of weddings? All the little hands go up and then I show them the Anderson's wedding picture and I say, okay, this is Mr. and Mrs. Anderson. They lived here in this house and this was their wedding picture. What can you tell me how it's different and how it's the same as a wedding picture you would see today? And the kids go, well, it's in black and white. Well, okay, the technology for the cameras was such that they didn't have color film. They didn't know how to make the colors come out. And then here's the camera that would have taken this picture. And well, the kid, they don't look too happy. They're not smiling. We have a lot of fun with that. But the truth of the matter is having a portrait taken of your wedding was serious business. It might cost a full day's pay for an Inco minor of the time. And you would have to go into a studio and stand, at, stand and sit absolutely still 
for the time it took for the shutter to open and close. And if you moved, you would be blurry in the picture. And I have a photograph of a group of people that were taken here at the Anderson Farm about 1917, and they're posed in front of the big barn we have here. And just as the picture was being taken, one of the Anderson's children standing in the front row had his dog in front of him. And he looked down at his dog to make sure the dog was looking at the camera. And Mrs. Anderson turned to tell him to be still because it's going to be blurry. And he looked back up and his brother turned to see what the commotion was. So the three of them are blurry in the photograph. And you can see the first boy with his dog. You can see the blurriness of his head going down and coming back up. The site came with the original contents. Some of it was already gone, but there were many, many items left here. At one point, a grandson of the Andersons, their oldest daughter's son, Dick Stevenson, came in and he had two green garbage bags stuffed with letters and bills and receipts and correspondence from the original farm. Included in there was a ledger book showing milk delivery door to door in Creighton Mine and it's all written in Finn, and it's by street and house number. Ironically, one of the streets is Lake Street, and number seven Lake Street is called Kisa House. From Finn, it translates roughly to Cat House. Whether they had a lot of pets or something else, no one knows. Uh, eventually, that location, that house, was moved here to the Anderson Farm from the village of Creighton Mine. That was a nice little hook. From the records that we obtained from those two green garbage bags, it really painted the picture of the business. Uh, they had 366 acres here in Lively. And what is Lively now, Lively didn't exist when the farm was established. They had another 366 acres of land out towards the Panache Lake Road turnoff. And they had a milk processing plant in Creighton Mine, and they had virtual monopoly on delivering milk in Creighton. And it, some research went around behind that, too. There's all kinds of things that come out of those bags. Recently, I received the badges for people who were going to sit in bleachers along Elm Street as uh, the king and queen visited Sudbury in 1939. Now, along the route, that the uh, royal couple paraded on, the contractors granted by the city built bleachers and then they charged 50 cents a head to sit in the bleachers along the route. And you would get a badge with a ribbon on it and a letter on it which would tell you where you would sit. And the envelope that the badge came in had the parking instructions, the rules for the day. You were not allowed to go sit in a different set of bleachers. And a gentleman who's moving to the Meadowbrook uh, Seniors Home gave me his mother and father's badges, but the best thing was he still had the envelope from 1939 that these badges came in. It was a one-day use item. I'll bet you there's not another envelope of this nature in the entire city. It's a disposable piece of paper, but it tells you a lot about the preparations that went into that day. Every day is like Christmas. You never know what's going to come through the door.